Hello everyone, this is lifestyle medicine cardiologist Dr. Stephen Lohman. In this video, I'm going to show you exactly how you could reverse heart disease. So let's do it. Yep, we could actually reverse heart disease and I'm going to give you the details in this video as to how exactly we can go about doing this. And I'm going to tell you straight out, I've had numerous patients take this approach and it's so powerful. It works so well. The joy in their face is just huge because they don't need medications. They know they're not going to need a stent or a bypass surgery and they feel good. They lose weight. This is the approach that we really should be taking with all cardiovascular disease situations. Treating the cause of somebody's illness works better than just simply putting a band-aid, giving a pill, a stent, a bypass. This is what we should be doing. I already did one video that was very thorough on prevention and reversal of heart disease. I'll link that in the description below and up here in the card. So check that one out. It'll go through a lot of details as to what you need to know to get to the advanced part of it, which is what we're going to talk about here. Some of the details and nuances as to what science shows actually works to reverse heart disease. So let's get right to it. So just in summary, to let you know, atherosclerosis, this porridgey, scarring, gooey, sticky stuff that really looks like cheese, we can make it go away. We truly can. There's good science that shows this. It starts really early in childhood and develops over adulthood and eventually can trigger heart attacks. And of course, it's better to try to prevent heart disease, to do all the right things from childhood. But what if you already have severe coronary artery disease? You're told you have a clogging, you're told you need a bypass surgery, and you just don't want to do it. You'd rather take a lifestyle medicine approach. Well, yeah, you can do it. The science clearly shows that we could avoid elective stenting of coronary arteries, elective bypass surgeries. Now, don't get me wrong. There are certain situations where putting a stent in the coronary artery or doing an open heart bypass surgery can be absolutely life-saving. But a vast majority of these procedures they're not needed and they carry a huge risk of heart attack and stroke and just the recovery of having to go through an open heart bypass surgery, sawing your chest open, taking veins out of your legs. You're laid up for three months. There's a 3% risk of dying and 3% risk of stroke as a complication. Taking a lifestyle medicine approach, there's pretty much no risk to it, right? You can only get benefits. So a lot of people choose that route. And so you really need to know how to do it right though because this is your life we're talking about. You don't want to mess it up. You got to go all in and do the right things to make sure you could avoid the stent, avoid the bypass surgery and live long and live well. Because as we know, heart disease has been the number one cause of death in America for more than 100 years in a row. And it's a serious disease, so we don't want to take it lightly. So I talked about in my video on prevention and reversal heart disease, how you have to drive your blood cholesterol levels crazy low and protect your endothelium at all costs. Super important that if you can, from a very young age, keep your LDL cholesterol level crazy low, maybe as low as 60 or even better, you're gonna be pretty well protected. But what if you are already older and your LDL has been high for a long time and you're clogged up? So this is when we're gonna figure out. Secondary prevention clinical trials, when somebody's already had cardiovascular disease, we do know that if you drive your LDL down as low as 30, 30, that event rates for heart attack, stroke, and needing a bypass surgery or stent are crazy low and approach zero. So that's, that's really what our goal should be. Our ideal cholesterol number should be a total at least under 150, and LDL at least under 70, and lower might be better. Don't worry about that HDL, and don't worry about those triglycerides. Those are numbers you don't need to worry about. In my last video on prevention of reversal heart disease, we went through a lot more details about food, about how we need to avoid all processed junk food, we need to avoid all animal foods, and focus on what we call a whole food, plant-based diet. And there's lots of reasons why, so please, again, check out that video. This diet, if you eat whole food, plant-based, has zero cholesterol, zero saturated fat, zero trans fats, and does not cause inflammation of the arteries whatsoever. You don't want even a little bit of inflammation going on if you're trying to reverse your heart disease. We know that Dr. Dean Ornish and Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn clearly showed in clinical trials that we can actually reverse heart disease. These are randomized controlled trials where they did angiograms, going in, squirting down to the coronary arteries to see the before and the after. The people who interpreted the angiograms are actually blinded as to which group people were in and blinded to before and after. And so this is real legitimate stuff. You can regress your heart disease. Here's one example angiogram of somebody five years apart following a whole food plant-based diet and other lifestyle modifications. And you see clearly where these arrows are, the disease reverses itself. More dramatic examples are available as well. Here is a stress test, a perfusion scan, a nuclear perfusion scan. 
And you see where the blood flow is, is lacking right here. Only three weeks of a whole plant food diet, and look what happens. The blood flow restores. Here is a 43-year-old surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic and only three years of no medications, no stents, no bypasses, just a whole food plant-based diet, and you get good reversals. So we can do this, and I'm gonna show you how. All right, so here are the basic overall concepts of heart disease reversal, dietary plans, and just how you could actually take the clogging and make it regress. So first, you need to avoid all foods and substances that cause any endothelial injury or dysfunction. The endothelium is the lining of the arteries. You don't want to do anything that causes dysfunction there. Second, avoid all the foods that increase your blood cholesterol levels. Third, increase the foods that produce natural nitric oxide for you. And then lastly, we got to keep the overall diet very, very low in fat, about 8 to 12 percent of total calories. That's the only dietary approach that's been shown to cause regression of coronary artery disease and atherosclerosis. So what do you need to avoid completely? And when I say completely, I mean absolutely 100% completely, not a drop of this stuff, no moderation. This needs to be out 100%. Again, we're talking about your life here. We need to avoid oil of any kind. We need to avoid any animal product. Nuts, nut butters, coconuts, and seeds, they are way too high in not only calorie density, but they keep you addicted to fat, and they do have some saturated fat, which can increase your LDL cholesterol levels. Now, a little bit of ground, flax seeds, chia seeds, you get your omega-3s, that's fine, small amounts. Olives, avocado, tofu, soy, these are the higher fat plant foods. You cannot achieve a percentage of calories from fat overall in your diet between 8 to 12% if you're consuming these. All processed sugars and refined carbohydrates, Caffeine, Esselstyn says straight out no caffeine. The Ornish diet said it was okay, so that's back and forth. Excessive salt in your diet. And then smoothies, you need to chew your food. It's so important not to do things in moderation. You gotta be all in. One single meal will knock out your endothelium, will cause significant endothelial dysfunction. So here on the left, you see a blood draw from somebody who ate a low-fat, plant-based meal. You could see straight through the vial and you could see the wording on the back. However, an animal-based, higher-fat meal clouds the blood just one single meal. You can't even read the words on the back of this vial. So it's no wonder every single thing you eat, you swallow, it goes into your stomach, absorbed into your bloodstream, it circulates throughout your body. It just takes one meal. Every single time you eat something that's high fat causing endothelial dysfunction, you're just pounding on the endothelium, causing it to be inflamed. And if your blood cholesterol levels are high on top of it, it's just gonna clog up those arteries slowly over the years. And you can imagine the typical American breakfast, lunch, and dinner is this high fat animal-based meal, lots of oils and refined carbohydrates and sugar pounding the endothelium and blood cholesterol levels are high. No wonder heart disease is the number one killer. One single meal. So there was a really funny part in the new and upcoming documentary called The Game Changers, where they demonstrated this very, very powerfully. They took three young, healthy athletes and they fed them one night grass-fed beef and the next night beans. And what did they measure? Erectile function at nighttime because guys get erections at night. They actually showed straight out that when you ate the grass-fed beef meal compared to the bean meal, you had worsening of endothelial function with just one meal. The nights where they ate the bean meal, they had a 400% increase in the time in which they had erections and an 8% increase in their circumference of the penis. The blood flow to the penis is really small. And so one meal causing dysfunction of this small penile artery will have a dramatic effect in the ability to maintain erections. So it was a really, really great scene, very powerful, done by a very well-known urologist, showing the effect that one single meal can have on your endothelial function. And man, you know, it made those people kind of wake up. And it makes sense. And this also applies to the coronary arteries too. You don't want even one single meal to cause damage. So his landmark publication showed using this brachial artery tourniquet test where you actually inflate the blood pressure cuff for five minutes. Ooh, it's uncomfortable. I've had it done before, not really habit forming, but you do this and then you release it and you measure how much does the brachial artery dilate after you feed people whatever food or you give them whatever drug and you could actually see the effect that that substance or food has on your overall endothelial function. And it clearly showed one high fat meal significantly reduced endothelial function. In this example, he actually used an egg McMuffin, a sausage McMuffin, and two hash browns from McDonald's, but it clearly showed compared to the cornflake group, 
which did not cause any significant endothelial dysfunction, that a single high fat meal can be very detrimental to your health. Now we can go over so many other things with this brachial artery tourniquet test. Things how blueberries can help endothelial function, vinegar can help endothelial function, and certain other things cause dysfunction of the endothelium. You know, red wine is okay, exercise is good, but one of the most important things is lowering your blood cholesterol levels actually not only stops your arteries from clogging, but it actually helps improve the endothelial function quite a bit, which is great. This is exactly what we want. So we're not gonna really get all mixed into the science. I'm gonna link some videos in the description below about it. But one thing I did wanna cover was the Mediterranean diet because a lot of people say, hey, I thought this Mediterranean diet was the way to go. You see this all the time in different recommendations for a heart healthy diet. Why are you talking about a whole food plant-based diet? Well, I'm gonna show you straight out that people on the Mediterranean diet still had heart disease and that olive oil did cause significant endothelial dysfunction. So the science clearly shows this. So there was this big study called the PREDIMED study, which was in Spain, multi-center. They randomized people to a Mediterranean diet with olive oil, a Mediterranean diet with nuts, or a control diet. And clearly the extra virgin olive oil group did have endothelial dysfunction, I'll show you. So there was no significant reduction in heart attacks, death from cardiovascular causes, or death from any cause in this study with these diets, right? That's what we care about. We care about the people die. Yes, there was a significant reduction in stroke only, but overall not a reduction in heart disease, cardiovascular disease, or overall death. So why is it? What's going on with it? Well, <clears throat> when a whole food plant-based diet, when you look at Ornish data and Nesselson data, the rates of cardiovascular events approach zero. However, in this PREDIMED trial with the Mediterranean diet, there was still a significant rate of cardiovascular events. Now they say stroke rates were lower, but look, there was still quite a few strokes. It was nowhere near approaching zero. So that's not what we want. We want to get as low, as close to zero as we possibly can. And so what they really showed is a Mediterranean diet that most people are consuming is better than most, most Americans are eating, right? Because most Americans are eating very, very unhealthy, but it might not quite be as good as a diet based on whole foods and plants that's low in fat, especially saturated fats and trans fats. That was the follow-up to the PREDIMED study. So, and clearly it's been shown in this publication called Appearance of New Lesions in Human Coronary Arteries, published by Blankenhorn, that eating oils will still progress new lesions, new clogging of arteries, new blockages. This study actually took a few people, quite a few people, and fed them different things and followed them over years. And oleic acid was actually shown straight out to be one of the main fats that caused new blockages, new plaques to form in the arteries. And guess what? 55 to 83% of the fat in olive oil is oleic acid. Olive oil causes endothelial dysfunction, has some saturated fat, and has been very clearly linked to new clogs. So olive oil is not a health food. I'm gonna do a whole video on why oil is not good for you. All right, so let's get into some of the other details. Nitric oxide, we want to do everything we can to help nitric oxide go up in your body. It's such an important substance. When your arteries are clogged, when you have cholesterol plaque all over your arteries, your arteries, your endothelium's ability to produce its own natural nitric oxide is way, way down. So I'm gonna show you what we can do to actually stimulate more production of nitric oxide, to bathe your endothelium in the powerful nitric oxide to help the endothelial function help cause regression of atherosclerosis. So the discovery of nitric oxide actually won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1998. It's just this very simple molecule, but it does so many good things. It keeps blood flowing smooth. It's the strongest blood vessel dilator, protects you from inflammation, protects you, of course, from atherosclerosis, and it stops the smooth muscles within the plaque from migrating up, which you don't want, and it destroys these nasty inflammatory cells called foam cells. So it's very important. Nitric oxide is produced by this enzyme called nitric oxide synthase. And this is such an important enzyme that we don't want to destroy, we don't want to damage because we want a lot of nitric oxide production. There is this enzyme that's called asymmetric dimethyl arginine, which helps to produce nitric oxide. But a lot of things can damage this ADMA, this asymmetric dimethyl arginine. We don't want things to damage it. All major risk factors like having hypertension, diabetes, being obese, tobacco smoke, damages this very fragile enzyme and will stop you from producing nitric oxide. So we don't want anything to do this. Oxidative stress 
chemical exposure. And so we want to protect ADMA from damage and injury as well, which is basically by eliminating all the risk factors uh, and the oxidative stress in your body. So how can we produce our own nitrates? How can we really increase the amount? Well, there are certain foods that when you eat them, it significantly increases the nitrates in your body. And here they are straight out. These are vegetables that have high amounts of nitrates. Beets, Swiss chard, oak leaf lettuce, beet greens, basil, spring greens, butter leaf lettuce, cilantro, rhubarb, and arugula. Now, a lot of people think straight out, I thought kale was super high in nitrates. It's supposed to be very healthy for me. And I thought beet juice is something that everybody always talks about. Well, beet juice, remember, we want to eat the whole food. So we want to avoid any juices if we can. But here's where kale and beet juice actually fall. Kale's pretty darn low. Beet juice, not so bad, but again, it's calorie dense. It's not natural. We're not chewing the beet, which is what we want. So that's not what we should do. We want six large servings a day. This is what Dr. Esselstyn recommends. Now, this sounds like a lot. Bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collard greens, beet greens, mustard greens, turnip greens, arugula, napa cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and basil. Whew, that's a lot. But if you'd actually have a serving about the size of your fist, you boil it down for about five minutes and put a little bit of balsamic vinegar on there, the acetic acid helps to activate some of the enzymatic process. That makes it a lot more palatable to eat and you can get these down. So this can help bathe your endothelium in natural nitric oxide. Understanding the nitrate nitrite cycle is gonna tell you exactly why it is you have to chew your greens. You cannot make them into smoothies and swallow them straight down because it bypasses an important enzymatic step to make your nitric oxide. This is how it works. When you eat your green leafy vegetables and you chew them in your mouth, the nitrate and some nitrate from the food enters into your digestive system, right? The bacteria then in your oral cavity are gonna reduce that nitrate to nitrite. Then down into your stomach, the gastric acid uh, ends up reducing the nitrite into nitric oxide. So the nitrate and then the remaining nitrite is gonna be absorbed into your intestine near bloodstream. The natural nitric oxide that your own endothelium does produce will kind of combine in with the nitrate and nitrite that you actually just had from those greens. And it actually, some of it goes back right up to your salivary glands and recirculated back to when you eat your next food, you're gonna have even more nitrate secreted out through your salivary glands. So if you actually just swallow in the form of a smoothie, all those greens, you're gonna miss that important enzymatic step in your salivary glands with the bacteria reducing the nitrate to nitrite. So you don't wanna miss that step. So make sure you actually chew your food, super important. One other very interesting thing about how eating these greens can end up helping your endothelium is actually a concept of what's called endothelial progenitor cells. It's kind of like a stem cell for your endothelium to help regrow them. There was this very clear study where they actually randomized Okinawan women to eating more green leafy vegetables in the typical Okinawan diet versus a control group, which didn't. If you had the green leafy vegetables, you had many more endothelial progenitor cells, the stem cells that actually originate the endothelial cells to help them to grow. And that's crazy important. You wanna heal up your endothelium. This publication in the New England Journal of Medicine actually showed the more endothelial progenitor cells that you have in your bloodstream, the longer you're gonna live, the better mortality you're gonna have. So eat those greens, not just for the nitric oxide, but your endothelial progenitor cells will go up too, and it's gonna help reverse your heart disease. And this is way more important for somebody with severe, severe coronary disease that just had a heart attack, was told they needed a bypass or a stent, and they're really, really trying super hard to avoid it. Maybe the first few weeks or so, go crazy all in on that. Now I wanted to talk about different types of heart disease reversal. Soft plaque is mostly made out of cholesterol. Non-calcified plaque, that's what you see here on the left. On the right is hard plaque. That's what you hear, hardening of the artery. This is a very calcified, scarred plaque. The damage is done there. The soft plaque on the left, we can maybe regress that with this dietary plan and all the things we talked about. We can make that percentage of the blockage go down and go down. However, the hard plaque on the right, that is already scarred and fixed in there. We're not gonna take that blockage if it was 80% and drop it to 60% or 50%. That's just not going to happen. However, we don't really need to worry about that because what we do know is the microvasculature, the very, very small arteries past the blockages will open up quite well. And that's why those stress tests improve so quickly within two to three weeks of changing your diet. That is why when people have severe angina 
after walking only a half a block or something, just two to three weeks of a whole food plant-based diet, dropping your cholesterol levels crazy low, improving your endothelial function, the angina just goes away better than any medication that you could ever imagine. So that's not because within two to three weeks, an 80 or 90% blockage dropped down to 50%. No, it's because the inflammation died down, the microvasculature, the very small arteries past the blockages that were feeding into the heart muscle were able to open up. So I wanted to mention one other thing. If people really want to go all in, they can go to Cleveland Heart Labs. Now I have no sponsorship from them. I don't take money. I get no kickbacks, nothing, no ties whatsoever, but they have a whole battery of tests that you can do. Not just cholesterol subtypes, but a bunch of different inflammatory markers. If you really wanted to get in detail, you could check them out and you can get your, some advanced testing done through them. And uh, it could be another way to see, hey, is what I'm doing right? All right, now after watching the Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease video and this video on the detail to reversing heart disease, you're absolutely convinced now that you need to do this in order to make sure you can regress your disease and keep your heart health as good as you possibly can. Where's that extra motivation? Where's that extra drive that you need to actually execute this? Check out some success stories and some testimonials. You go to ForksOverKnives.com, you'll see success stories after success story after success story after success story. They're all over the place. Check those out. They will inspire you. And then what you need to do is educate yourself as to other reasons that you should be eating plant-based. That'll give you more motivation, more drive to stick to it. Meaning the ethical reasons, watch the documentary called Dominion, and the environmental reasons, watch the documentary called Cowspiracy. You watch these, it'll open your eyes as to where your food comes from and the impact that it actually has in the environment. And maybe that's what you need to give you that extra inspiration to eat plant-based and reverse your heart disease. To summarize heart disease reversal, focus on your cholesterol numbers, get your LDL crazy low, maybe as low as 30 even, understand heart disease though, knowledge is power, protect your endothelium from damage at all costs, you have the most power over your own health. Isn't this the greatest thing? You're the one that's the most empowered to take control of your own health. It's not to the drugs, it's not at the genetics, or your doctor did the right thing with stents or bypasses. This puts the control into your own hands. Try your best to use this lifestyle medicine approach with diet and, and such in order to avoid risky procedures. And then now it's time to go out and learn the skill. Dr. Dean Ornish and his big clinical trials of reversing heart disease, he did not include only diet. He also included exercise, yoga, and what he called love and support. And those things are very, very important. Here's what I would say about that. The animal studies clearly show diet is the important part. Esselstyn's study didn't include any exercise, didn't include any wellness or yoga or love and support, and he had great disease regression. The diet is clearly the most important thing, the whole food plant-based diet. However, in order to maintain that diet long-term, you need the support. If you have low stress levels, you have good family support, a support group, there's so many different support groups around. Check out pbnm.org and other places, meetup.com, you'll find support groups around. Have that support. That'll allow you to be more successful long-term with a heart disease reversal type of a diet. The diet is the most important part. But don't ignore the wellness aspect. Don't ignore the exercise and the yoga aspect because that's what's going to allow you to overall stick to the diet. And long-term, that's what you want to do is you want to stay on it for the rest of your life. Well, I hope you liked this video. Please give me a comment in the section below. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and turn those notifications on. All my social media links are down below in the description. So hopefully you can empower yourself to reverse heart disease and we could just annihilate this disease that need not exist. See you next time.